Well, good day, everybody. So good to have you guys here with us today. We're so blessed to have with us our big brother in the spirit. He's one of my heroes of faith, really, uh, Pastor Randy Alonzo. Uh, he's a senior national representative with Bridges for Peace. He's been one of the most uh, greatest men to touch the West Coast of the United States for Bridges for Peace that we've ever had. He's building relationships between Christians and Jews you know, in Israel and around the world, mm -hmm. and in California. This is his main area of responsibility. He's also the pastor of development and strategic partnership at Lineage Church here in Coco. This is now their second church that they have. They have a, another church in Melbourne. I'm sure he'll tell you more about that. And he's also a certified life coach for John Maxwell trainers. He's a trainer of trainers. He's a coach of coach. He's a pastor of pastors. <laughs> He's my brother, and let's welcome our oh, brother. Thank you, Jack. Jesus name. Yeah. Good to see you guys this afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Honored to be with you. It's been a little while, and you know, fuel has rolled along for years now. And if you go back in the archives, I think I was the third speaker at Fuel, and um, our brother was telling me there's about 300 videos in the archives over these many years of doing this. So it's an honor to be with you today. Yeah, I'm, I've been a local pastor here on the Space Coast for really 27 years, and uh, 17 years the senior pastor of what was then. Uh, Biblia turned central and now is Lineage Church, and then we turned it over to my son Ryan uh, 10 years ago. And uh, he's now 40 years old, and time marches on. And uh, we just opened a new location down in Melbourne, which I kind of oversee that. And uh, we're loving life on the Space Coast. How about you? Well, great place to live, isn't it? And make a life here. I, this is a great place. And um, so, as men of God today, I, I certainly. Um, love being with you of course and want to speak to you as men i want to talk to you about how that healthy men do great things and i'm i'm, I'm so encouraged today uh, as i am about what god can do with people men like yourselves who sell out who surrender to god unequivocally and i see the active work of the the holy spirit in the world today and i think the holy spirit is orchestrating things in the world um, he's always been doing that, but it's as active and prolific as I've, I've seen. The gospel is advancing in the world today, gentlemen. Don't be, um, don't uh, embrace anything that tells you that, that the church is dying. The, the gospel is going forth, and that's prophetic. That's what the Bible said would happen. And if you're a part of a life-giving church, you're, you're a part of that, that kingdom uh, building that's going on. And of course, one of the honors of our life uh, has been to be connected to Bridges for Peace. And I started supporting Bridges for Peace in 1998. I can't believe how those years have rolled by. And um, we took that on as a, our number one partner, and it has been ever since because of Paul's admonition to the Jew first. We thought, well, we can do that. We found this awesome organization right in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other part, othermost parts, I thought, well, let's just go back to ground zero and start there and invest in bridges for peace and, and take Jesus' words literally, you know, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. It's been our honor to be a part of that all these years and then to be a board member of Bridges for Peace for about 18 years and uh, now a senior national representative. It's my honor and pleasure to go about the country speaking on behalf of of Bridges for Peace. I had the honor of being up at Liberty University last fall, one week after October 7th. And uh, I was to speak to a group of uh, college singles on a Tuesday night. I was also at Thomas Road Baptist Church there. And um, they said, oh, pastor, um, you know, we normally have 100 students here. And it might be a low night tonight for this fellowship because it's also, there's a football game and the Liberty Flames are undefeated. And, uh, and so they were kind of playing it down. Well, mind you, one week after October 7th, and I had already publicized my topic, uh, Israel, Hamas, and the end times. 200 students, 200 showed up. And they've invited me to come back this fall. Those are just one of many things we get to do when we're working with Israel. And it's been my honor and privilege to go there 34 times. And so spend a significant amount of my life over there and continually go back. And um, it's just an honor. And I thank you, Jack, for the introduction. I've known you for many years. Champion prayer warrior for Bridges for Peace. You know, it's pretty cool when you go across the country and you meet people who are your partners 
with us here in, in Melbourne. And when I get to their house or have their dinner, they say, hey, thank Jack for me because he prayed with me last month about my illness or my family or my work or whatever. You know, what, you know how that paves the way for a guy like me when, when he's been praying with the people I get to go meet? Well, that's his mission and that's his passion. And I'm proud to know him and I count on him as a prayer warrior and a blessing. Scott Sober is also here today and he's a CFO at our U.S. side of Bridges for Peace. And uh, so I'm amongst a couple buddies here and um, an honor to be with you. When I say healthy men do great things, I see the active work of the Holy Spirit. I see the evidence of God everywhere I go. I also believe it's never been harder on the individual because we have an enemy that's, a, a, that's after us. There's an old, old preacher said that the, the, the devil be after you, right? And he is because he's always looking for the weak link in our, in our armor. And no matter how long we walk with the Lord, and, and obviously we get stronger as the years go by, but the enemy is not any less relentless. He's still going to look for a weak spot in your character, your armor, wherever he can find you or tempt you, no matter how strong you get in the Lord. All right? Until we're with him in his presence, we'll be delivered completely from the enemy's attack on our lives. And so when I say that, what I mean is the pressures to perform for men like yourselves today, particularly if you're in the workforce, the pressure to keep up, the pressure to excel, the pressure sometimes to do it all in the workplace, in the home, parenting, in the school, athletics, wherever it may be, ministry. If we're not careful, we can succumb to the unhealthy expectations that culture, peers, and media put on us. And, and that's why we have to be anchored in our relationship to Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8, he said, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And amen to that. So how do you stay healthy? How, how do you stay a, a godly man in this world at this time in which God has called us where we live and lead? Number one, Here's my admonition to you today. Get your theology right. What is theology? Theology is the study of the nature of God and religious beliefs. And when I say get your theology right, I'm not talking as though you are probably labeling yourself as a theologian. Although if you study the nature of God and religious beliefs, Gentlemen, you are theologians, all right? So don't, don't let just academia have that or, or, you know, accomplished pastors reserve the right to be called a theologian. And I understand the whole, the whole side of that, and I respect it very much. But if you're studying the nature of God, you're studying the Word of God, and you're discerning it, my brother, give yourself some, some credit, all right? Because you can probably answer about 95% of the questions that would walk down this sidewalk right now in relation to God, Right? Because the, the questions that people ask you who are lost are not hard for you to answer. And sometimes we think it is, but it's not. And so I encourage, you, I encourage you that way. And so the starting point for all of us when it comes to good theology and getting our theology correct is simply who we are. Who we are in Christ. Um, when we came to God, our starting point, we were unqualified, we were sinful, and we were inadequate. And then God took us who were dead in trespasses and sin. And the Bible says, I like the old King James word on this, he quickened us. It means made alive in an instant, in a millisecond, from death to life. It's still incredible to me. I don't know when you were saved, but if you'll go back to that moment, I think particularly if it's beyond childhood, you probably really remember the effect of the gospel coming upon you and convicting you of your sin. And, and at that moment, God transforming you instantaneously, right? And so what, what happens is God takes us who say yes to him and invite Christ into our life and then make ourselves available to him. And then what does he do? Then he qualifies you. Then he makes you adequate. Then he empowers you. Amen? I had a guy at Bible study last night in our new location in Melbourne. The young guy's been saved for 14 years. I said, tell me your story. And he started telling me. And I, I could tell he's on fire for the Lord, you know. And he, said, he made this comment that fits this thought right here. He said, you know, I realized that when Christ saved me, I was an adult man, and I knew I'm either going to be all in 
or I'm not going to be all in. And I decided I'm all in. You know what? You string some yeses together for God and you'll always be in the will of God. If you continue to tell, tell God when He prompts you, yes, Lord, and you don't make any reservations and you don't tell Him no, you'll always be a fulfillment of the Great Commission. You realize that? Because faithfulness wins. And you'll get to exactly where God wants you to be by being all in. And so in God's eyes, you see, you're already enough. That's good theology, men. You're already enough. We should all be living with the attitude of gratitude. Away from the kind of pressure that I just said makes it hard on the individual. You're not in performance mode for God. You're not trying. You're not hoping that you'll be right in His sight. My goodness, the grace of God completely forgave you when He took you from death to life. And listen, if He did that at the first moment, that He convicted you, it's no less today than it was at that moment because you were never more far gone than you were at that moment. And He loved you completely then. That status has never changed. And so that's good theology. My son, Ryan, you know, I kind of use him as an illustration. You can do the same thing with your children. You go back to when they were one, two, five years old, 12 years old, now adult man, 40 years old. I've never looked at him once and thought he needs to be more than he is as his father. He's always been enough, right? And the Heavenly Father sees you and I the very same way. Remember when Jesus was baptized and he came up out of the water and the Heavenly Father said, this is my son whom I love and am well pleased. You realize he hadn't performed miracles yet. He hadn't performed his ministry yet. He had not recruited the twelve to himself yet. He had not been to the cross yet. And God saying, I love him just the way he is. And God loves you right where you're at today. I'm, the, 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 the pretense to that is you're surrendered. You're all in. You're a child of the king. And so I love the encouragement with that. And I like to add this thought to this. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, some of this actually applies to you very specifically because it's written to pastors bishops and elders, interchangeable words in the New Testament for that office, right? He said, here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. You know what that verse has always said to me? Godly ambition is a good thing. It's okay to want to be an overseer, Mr. Hal Moore. It's okay to want to be an overseer. It's, it don't, you know, a lot of times when I would talk to guys about leadership in the church, they would play it down. Oh, no, not me. No, I, I couldn't be that. Wait a minute. It's okay to want to be that. Don't, don't, it's almost like a false humility. If God's raising you up, step into it. Go where He's calling you to go. I want to encourage you in your godly ambition today. Whatever that godly ambition is. Paul said to Timothy, fan the flame. Fan the flame. Stir it up. Get hot. Go for it. Right? That's the first thought. Get your theology right. Second thought is this. Set reasonable expectations. Healthy men do great things and they learn how to set reasonable expectations. It's a tension point to be managed. I struggled with this early in my adult life, in my ministry life, my late 20s and about a 10 year period where I was so driven, so excited, and I was in the ministry and I was planting a church in San Diego and in the next 10 years I planted and handed that off. Uh, I, I took another church and, and took it from a small group to a very large group in four or five years and I had so many things going on. And I saw God blessing everything that was going on around me. The ministry was flourishing. But on the inside, I did not have the capacity, character-wise, even spiritual maturity-wise, to keep up with what God was doing around me, if that makes sense. All that He had put my hand to do and more was being blessed. And at the end of the day, I was going, I'm not doing well. And part of the reason for that was I had set re unreasonable expectations on myself as a leader and I wasn't growing into the capacity that I could have had I followed the Lord more purely with managing what He had put into my leadership. And so my encouragement when that happens to us is 
we have to be realistic about the expectation we put on ourselves, and even with our outward success, combating the inward feeling of not being enough or doing enough or failing on the inside. That was bad theology for me during that 10 year period. Um, I I'll, I'll put it, I'll capsulize it this way. I was not spirit filled, and I hate to use the word, but I was, I was driven in a carnal way. I was doing it in my own might, and eventually my own might ran out. And the reversal that happened through the transition of brokenness was literally learning how to be led by the Holy Spirit and let His prompting lead me to the, to the breath of what God wanted me to do. Uh, Jerry Falwell, famously back in the day, when he first started Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, uh, on his one-year anniversary, he had 1,700 people show up for the anniversary. And he was driven, right? And he had an old sage who lived outside of town. And he said, I would retreat to this old sage out to on, on his farm, 30 miles out of town, because he was just living life, but he was wise and he loved the Word of God. And he said, I would go out there and tell him all that I was doing. And he said, he was always so calm, full of wisdom. And he said, on that one year anniversary, I could not wait till that Monday to travel out to just take a break that day because you'd been working hard and tell my old sage friend what had happened. And he said, I'll never forget. This was in his autobiography. He said, I went to my old friend and I said, all that we had done in that year, that 1,700 people. And he said, he paused for a moment and he looked at me and he said this. He said, Jerry, if you'll take care of the depth of your ministry, God will always take care of the breadth of your ministry. Man, I want to tell you, some statements to stick with you. Because I went through a process of brokenness around that very thought, what it was saying is, you go deep with God. He'll manage the breadth of what he's put your hand to do. Goals are great, but unhealthy expectations on ourselves are not. So don't let a goal set an unsustainable pace in your life. And that's my commentary on that. God, I put an unsustainable pace on the breath of what was happening, and I internally wasn't keeping up with it. But I thought, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. You know, little boys, I'll use athletics, when they love, love sports, they'll dream about, usually, they want to be a professional whether it's basketball, football, baseball. I mean, come on, when you're 12 years old and you're watching television, right, and you're seeing the pro ranks and you feel like maybe I could be good at that, your little boy may say to you, I'm gonna be a major league baseball player someday. And in your mind, what are you thinking? That's a great aspiration, but we got a long way to go to find out if you got the goods to be at that elite 500 people, right? I think it was Charles Barkley who famously said, your son is not going to be a National Basketball Association player. You know, and here's a guy who did go there, but he knew there are millions who want to be. There's only about 500 that are. Wow, that's powerful, isn't it? It also tells you about the kind of talent it takes to get to that level. I don't care what the discipline is. So I, I played baseball for a lot of years and had a lot of success with it. And having those same aspirations, and so now whenever I've coached or talked to young ball players, which I love to do, one being my grandson, and I'm hearing him say, Major League Baseball, I'm going to be the next Shohei Otani or whatever. I, here's what I say to him. Hey, let's first be a great high school player. Let's get there first. Or let's make the all-star team, which he did. <laughs> let's make the all-star team where we're at. Do you follow me? Expectation and take it a step at a time. I found that's healthy for me too as an adult man. Here's the third thought about healthy men do great things. Compare hustle, not goals. And because I like sports so much, I think it's one of the most powerful ways in a short amount of time to actually witness hustle, right, in an athletic event. And it's that guy who may not be as tall, as muscular, as formed or whatever, or built, but you realize he got something going on inside of him. You know, we might call it no quit, hustle. He just 
knows I will compensate for any inadequacy on the physical realm by the sheer desire to move a little bit quicker, think a little bit faster, get to that place before the other guy gets there. That's a great analogy for me when it comes to life. Uh, and so I encourage men, when you hustle, you're, 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 you're able to usually get to the right place a little bit quicker simply because you had a desire to be aware and to not procrastinate. And so I say, I say to men, don't compare results. Compare effort if you're going to compare anything. Because good things come to those who hustle. You know, whether it's that discipline to get up a little bit early, work a, just a little bit longer, whatever it is, do it with joy. But I think you're probably, if you're like me, the older I've gotten, the more I appreciate discipline. And the more I enjoy my discipline. How many of us would not trade our alone time for God for anything at this point in life? And if you, like me, have probably created a little bit more margin for yourself so you can have it in a quality way. You know, back when I was driven in my 20s and 30s, I was a pastor, but my quiet time was probably about five minutes. And then I'm on to sermons and content and leading and, and dreaming and moving fast, you know. And the older I've got, it's that depth thing. I'm going, wait a second. Now that generates my hustle, right? I hope you get my point. Paul said, one plants, one waters. Who gives the increase? Yeah. You may not always see the results immediately of your hustle, and you want to see it immediately. But if you'll put yourself in the right place, you'll always make progress, and you'll always be right where God wants you to be so that He can give you the increase that He's planning for. 2 Corinthians 10.12 we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. So when you focus on hustle, here's what you're doing. You turn inward and you simply say to yourself, did I give it my best effort? Do I pillow my head at night and go, Lord, I did all that you asked me to do today to the best of my ability and I will now rest and get ready for the next 24 hours. And take a little bit of credit for yourself that you put the effort out, that you did, you know what I mean by hustle, you had a little bit of grit, you made the extra call, you went the extra mile, you did the extra thing for your wife, your kids, your grandkids, your work, whatever it was. You know, I put the effort in today. And we know when we didn't, and so we correct it. Just correct it and go the next day, right? Here's the last thing I give you. Don't quit in the dip. Don't quit in the dip. Hope is the antidote to weariness. Be not weary in well-doing, Paul said in Galatians 6. If you sow, in due season you will reap. Don't quit in the dip. We all get in the dip, don't we? Or we all get in a rut. What's the old saying about the rut? You know, up in Canada, they have ruts that are 20 miles long, you know, <laughs> off-road stuff. It's a coffin with the ends kicked out. You know, that's a rut. And uh, it's easy to get into the dip. We all have a downtime. But I love what Pastor Chris Hodges says from Church of the Highlands. He says, make good repeatable. That's powerful three words. Make good repeatable. Do you have a good routine? Are you creating good patterns of behavior in your life? Are you cutting out the baggage, the excess baggage that Hebrews talks about that weighs you down? Are you honestly assessing? Are you exerting some levels of discipline upon yourself? We live in the illusionment of comfort. What was the quote, what was the title of that book, Scott, you were telling me about? The one about comfort. I forget, we talked about a couple books before we walked in here. We, my point is this, we live in a comfort society. Sometimes I have to self-discipline myself to make myself a little uncomfortable, right? I mean, literally, whether it's something I push back from the table, whether it's a discipline as far as my health or work, 
or whatever it is. It can be very physical, just temperatures, right? And, and get myself out of my norm of wanting more of that good comfort that my body uh, you know, screams at me for. The size and timing of the harvest in your life is God's department. You do the next right thing today and turn that good day into another day, turn it into another day, and the accumulative effect of your consistency, then God is handling the outside of that, and I'm, I'm managing to keep my peace with God and man by being at peace with myself as I give it my best effort, right? And I work through the low times and, and the dip in my spirit uh, when things haven't gone as well as I would like them. You know, a farmer would be foolish uh, once he's put the seed in the ground to stress over when is that thing going to come out of the ground and how much harvest am I going to get. Now, he'll do all he can to fertilize and care for, but guess what? Until that rain comes from heaven, he can work as hard as he wants and try all the artificial things he wants. But if he's smart and he's going to last as a farmer, he puts that seed in the ground and he's going, the rest is not in my department. That's in God's department. And that's a good life lesson, isn't it? Listen to this, Matthew 9, 38. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. The principle I give you there is when you get to verse 39, and it says, ask the who of the harvest? The Lord of the harvest. Don't ask the harvest. Ask the Lord of the harvest. And I'm telling you, that's a subtle little subtle little thing in our brain about our effort and God's favor and blessing on it, right? I'm doing the right thing today. I'm going to be consistent in that. And I'm going to be healthy in, in God's eyes, in my eyes, my family's eyes. And I'm going to, I'm going to pillow my head knowing I, I did what God asked me to do today. And I know the results are coming because he's the Lord of the harvest. And so I close with this. Um, in the spirit of being healthy. Wake up, try this, wake up in the morning and try this as two parts of the first part of your prayer. Number one, I have a father who loves me. Wake up in the morning going, I'm in a good place. I have a father in heaven and he loves me. Second thing is, the harvest is coming. God, I'm with you. Now here we go. I hope that blesses you. We pray for heaven, and we pray for health. How you doing? Good? I just want to encourage you today. I'm encouraged. Been walking with the Lord for, it'll be 50 years next February. I still can't believe it, because I feel like I'm nine years old. I act like it. That's my wife. Uh, I hope you have a youthful enthusiasm. But as I look at that, and I think to myself, only only in the family of God can you do something for 50 years and be more excited today than the first day you ever entered into the family. How is that? It ain't me. It's the Spirit of God who lives in me. Aren't you glad? Huh? I'm so excited. I'm ready. I'm ready, man. Right now, it'd be great. Let's go home, all right? But you know what? I'm good to stay. And I am excited about life and ministry and uh, helping the next generation grow up strong. Father God, what a blessing to be in this place with these good men. And I thank you that they have hearts for you. And I thank you for the word of God that we long to hear and extract its truth of which we never exhaust. And it's life-giving. And the word we speak today in your presence, Father, among these good men is a word that always lifts our spirit, inspires us for the next venture, dream, goal, whatever we have, and doing that with such peace because we have a Father who loves us and the harvest is in your control. Father, we love you. We commit ourselves to you fresh and new to enjoy this moment and we thank you in advance for all that's coming because of your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.